again to Tom's Hit Parade. Uh, it is time for the final installment of Backtracks for 2018. This is it, December. Uh, I don't know where the year went, but it's just about gone. So what can I say that I didn't already say a month ago? But anyway, yes, Backtracks, my monthly roundup of notable artists' birthdays and album anniversaries to Visible by Five. So let's just jump right on into the birthdays. French classical composer Hector Berlioz would be 215 years old this month. 160 years ago this month saw the birth date of Italian opera composer Giacomo Puccini. 100 years ago this month was born Henry Bird, also known as blues musician Professor Longhair. This month would be the 95th birthday of opera legend Maria Callas, and the 85th birthday of soul and R&B singer Lou Rawls. Happy 80th birthday this month to the late rock and roll pioneer Bo Diddley. Uh, celebrating their 75th birthday this month would be rock and blues musician J.J. Kale, as well as jazz saxophonist Grover Washington Jr. Uh, turning 70 years old this month, the Prince of Darkness Ozzy Osbourne and Queen of Disco Donna Summer. Jazz singer Diane Schur would be celebrating her 65th birthday this month, actually is, she's not dead. Uh, Happy 60th birthday wishes go out this month to British singer Limal, frontman for the band Kaja Gugu. Happy 55th birthday this month to Metallica drummer Lars Ulrich. Turning 50 years old this month is R&B singer Montel Jordan. A happy 45th birthday this month to Slipknot frontman and vocalist Corey Taylor. Singer Nelly Furtado and R&B musician John Legend are celebrating their 40th birthdays this month. And happy 30th December birthday to Tyler Joseph of 21 Pilots. And now let's head right on into the final list of album anniversaries for 2018. In December of 1963, Stevie Wonder released his third album with a song in my heart. It was his first album without the prefix little before his name, and he recorded it at the age of 13. It featured the Rogers and Hart penned title track and the Johnny Mercer tune Dream, as well as the classics Put on a Happy Face and When You Wish Upon a Star. Also released 55 years ago this month was Doris Day's album Love Him. It was produced by her son Terry Melcher and featured the singles Can't Help Falling in Love, which was made famous by Elvis Presley, of course, as well as As Long As He Needs Me from the musical Oliver and the Willie Nelson song Nightlife. Half a century ago, the Rolling Stones released Beggar's Banquet. It was their seventh album in the UK and their ninth in the US. It was the last album released before the death of Brian Jones and it peaked at number 5 on the Billboard 200 charts and number 3 on the UK, Australian, and Canadian charts. Rolling Stone magazine ranked at number 58 on their list of the greatest albums of all time, and it featured the singles Street Fighting Man, No Expectations, and Sympathy for the Devil. Also released in November of 1968 was Blood, Sweat, and Tears self-titled sophomore album. It won the Grammy for Album of the Year, spent seven weeks at number 1 on the Billboard 200, and was certified four times platinum. It was produced by James William Garcio, who was actually working on an album with Chicago at the time. And it was also one of the first 16-track recordings. It featured the singles And When I Die, as well as two of their biggest hits, You've Made Me So Very Happy and Spinning Wheel. Happy 45th anniversary this month to I Got a Name, Jim Croce's fifth and final album, which was released 11 weeks after his death in an airplane crash. It reached number two on the Billboard 200 and Canadian charts, and it featured the number one single, I'll Have to Say I Love You in a Song, as well as Working at the Car Wash Blues and the title track, both of which went top ten. Also released in November of 1973 was Yes's sixth album, Tales from Topographic Oceans. It was a concept album consisting of four 20-minute tracks inspired by the four Hindu texts known as Shastras. And despite the odd concept and a bit of ridicule for its unusual and overblown approach, the double album was a commercial success. It was actually the first UK album to go gold based only on pre-orders. It spent two weeks at number one in the UK and it peaked at number six in the US. Forty years ago this month saw the release of the soundtrack from the blockbuster superhero film Superman, composed by my favorite film composer John Williams and performed by the London Symphony Orchestra. Jerry Goldsmith was actually originally hired to score the film but had to decline over scheduling conflicts. This score earned John Williams his 10th Oscar nomination for original score and his 14th nomination overall with three wins to date, but it lost out to Midnight Express, but he did gain a revenge of sorts with his 8th Grammy win out of 11 nominations in 1980 for original score. 
I have to confess that sometimes I put the DVD in just so that I can geek out over the amazing main title sequence with that music. Anyway, uh, also released in November of 1978 was Natural Act, Chris Christopherson and Rita Coolidge's third and final duets album before their divorce the following year. It was released at Coolidge's career peak, although it was far less successful than her two previous albums. By contrast, it was Christopherson's only album to chart in the UK. It featured the songs I Fought the Law, Love Don't Leave Here Anymore, and Back in My Baby's Arms. Happy 35th anniversary this month to Slade's 11th album, The Amazing Kamikaze Syndrome. It reached number 49 on the UK charts and featured their hit singles My Oh My and Run Run Away, both of which went top 10 in the UK. For the North American market, the album was retitled Keep Your Hands Off My Power Supply, and it peaked at number 26 in Canada and number 33 in the US, and those same two singles made the top 40 here in the States. Also released in November of 1983 was Slayer's debut album Show No Mercy. The recording was self-financed with money borrowed from guitarist Kerry King's father and the savings of vocalist Tom Araya, who was actually working as a respiratory therapist at the time. It became the highest selling release to date for label Metal Blade Records, selling 20,000 copies, compared with the average releases 5,000. 30 years ago this month, well, presumably because there are no actual release dates that I could find for these albums, but the list of albums for December 1988 on Wikipedia kind of sucks, so let's just go with it. Uh, Katie Lang's debut album, Shadowland. It reached number 73 on the Billboard 200 and number 9 on the Billboard Country Albums charts as well as number nine on the Canadian Albums Chart. It featured the singles Busy Being Blue, Lock, Stock, and Teardrops, and Honky Tonk Angels Medley, featuring country legends Brenda Lee, Loretta Lynn, and Kitty Wells. Also released around that same time was What Up Dog, the third album by Was Not Was. It reached number 43 on the Billboard 200, number 47 in the UK, and number 41 in New Zealand. And Rolling Stone ranked at number 99 on their list of 100 best albums from the 80s. It featured the top 10 single, Walk the Dinosaur, and the top 20 single, Spy in the House of Love. A quarter of a century ago, Jodeci released their second album, Diary of a Mad Band. It spent two weeks at number one on the Billboard R&B Albums chart and peaked at number three on the Billboard 200. It boasts the uh, first album appearances by Timbaland and Missy Elliott about two years before they became known in the music industry. And it featured the singles, Cry For You, Fienin, and What About Us. Another sophomore album that made its debut in November of 1993 was Enigma's The Cross of Changes. It reached number 9 on the Billboard 200 and number 1 in the UK. It featured the singles Eyes of Truth, The Age of Loneliness, and their smash hit song Return to Innocence, which went number 1 in Ireland, Norway, and Sweden, and top 10 in the UK, Canada, US, and 7 other countries. Happy 20th anniversary this month to Sarah Brightman's 6th album, Eden. In contrast to her previous mostly English albums, several tracks on this album are opera arias sung in Italian. It includes one classic pop rock cover, her interpretation of Kansas's Dust in the Wind, which became popular in Brazil. The album went top 10 in Sweden, Canada, New Zealand, and four other countries, and also featured the songs Deliver Me, So Many Things, and the title track. Also released in November of 1998 was Ladies and Gentlemen, The Best of George Michael. This two-disc, 28-track collection includes several tracks not on George Michael albums, such as I Knew You Were Waiting For Me, his duet with Aretha Franklin, and also a duet with Elton John, Don't Let the Sun Go Down On Me. The album peaked at number 24 on the Billboard 200 and stayed on the chart for 27 weeks, and it ended up, ended up selling more than 15 million copies worldwide to date. November 2003 saw the release of Alicia Keys' sophomore album, The Diary of Alicia Keys. It debuted at number one on the Billboard 200 and stayed on the chart for 88 weeks. It also went number one in Switzerland and reached the top 10 in six other countries. It earned her three Grammys, including Best R&B Album, and featured the singles You Don't Know My Name, If I Ain't Got You, and Diary, all of which were top 10 singles, and the top 20 single, Karma. Also released 15 years ago this month was Hoobastank's sophomore album, The Reason. It was produced by Howard Benson. It peaked at number three on the Billboard 200 and went top 10 in France and Canada. It was eventually certified double platinum and was the 24th best-selling album of 2004. It featured the singles Out of Control, Same Direction, Disappear, and the smash hit title track, which went number one in Brazil, Canada, and Italy, hit number two on the Billboard Hot 100, and was top 20 in 11 other countries and earned them a Grammy nomination for Song of the Year. Ten years ago this month, Fallout Boy released their fourth album, Folie Adieu. 
It was their third consecutive top ten album, but performed less strongly than its predecessor, peaking at number eight, and it spent two weeks in the top twenty. Its most successful single, I Don't Care, barely missed the top twenty, peaking at twenty-one. Other singles included America's Sweethearts, Head First Slide into Cooperstown on a Bad Bet, and What a Catch, Donnie. Also released in December of 2008 was All American Rejects' third album, When the World Comes Down. It peaked at number 15 on the Billboard 200 charts and was certified gold, and it featured the singles Gives You Hell, which reached number 4 on the Hot 100, as well as I Wanna and The Wind Blows. Turning five years old this month, Childish Gambino's second album, Because the Internet. It boasted guest appearances by Azalea Banks, Chance the Rapper, and Jenny Aiko, and it peaked at number 7 on the Billboard 200 and number 12 in Canada. It was certified gold in February 2016 and featured the singles 3005, or is that 3005? Crawl, Sweatpants, and Telegraph Avenue. Also released in December of 2013 was Beyonce's self-titled fifth album. Like the rest of her albums, it reached number one on the Billboard 200 charts and also number one in Canada, Croatia, Poland, and the UK. It also went top ten in more than 15 other countries. It was the tenth best-selling album in the world in 2013, and it was declared the best album of the year by Billboard, the LA Times, and Houston Chronicle, and the best album of 2014 by Vibe Magazine and the New York Times. It received five Grammy nominations, including Album of the Year and Best Urban Contemporary Album. It featured the single Drunk in Love, which won the Best R&B Song and Best R&B Performance Grammys, as well as EXO, Partition, and Pretty Hurts. And now it is time for the final Spotlight Album of 2018. And this one actually differs a bit from, I think, all of the other Spotlight albums in that this is actually the first dip I've ever taken into this artist. I don't even have any uh, Greatest Hits albums or anything by them, except, there, I mean, there might be a stray song on a compilation that I have, or I've probably heard their songs um, on the radio, incidentally, or whatever. But yes, this is my first real deliberate taste of this band. It is the fifth album by Black Sabbath, Sabbath Bloody Sabbath. Uh, it is 45 years old this month, and uh, I gotta say, I like this stuff. I did not think I would be all that crazy about it, but uh, honestly, I love the entire second side of this album, really. Uh, I mean, Ozzy Osbourne was a bit of a selling point. I've got actually got his, well, actually, as you saw a little bit ago, I've got his greatest hits, um, essential, two disc greatest hits. So, uh, yeah, his, his uh, being there was a draw for me to, uh, uh, compelled me to try out this band. But uh, yeah, this is this is a great album. I actually enjoyed it a lot more than I thought I would, uh, and it's got a lot of uh, a lot of varying textures. More, it's got more variation in the sound than I thought it would. It's got oh, what did it say? It's got a flute on one of the songs, uh, "Looking for Today," I think it was. So that gives it a little bit of a Jethro Tull sort of a sound, and uh, oh, the Moog synthesizer on I think it was "Who Are You." Uh, See, so, and that's probably why I like the second side so much is that it's got you know so many different sounds. And, you know, okay, it's the sounds that aren't typically in hard rock or metal that kind of attract me more. So, you know, but at least, if, hey, if that serves as an inroad, inroad into getting me a little bit more into metal, hey, why not, right? But, uh, yeah, this was, this was a fantastic album. I, I really uh, enjoyed it. Uh, a very pleasant surprise, I guess you'd say. So, uh, yeah, if you have not heard this album in, in particular, give it a try. And, yes, this is going to... Uh, this is not going to stop me from uh, getting uh, at least one more album of Black Sabbath, giving them a further listen. Uh, but yeah, excellent album, fantastic. Oh, and uh, a, a trivia note on this album, uh, keyboardist Rick Wakeman of the band Yes, who were actually recording their album Tales from Topographic Oceans in a nearby studio, was brought in to, uh, as a session player on the song Sabra Cadabra, for those of you who didn't know. So uh, yeah, that was kind of an interesting... Uh, trivia note. And, oh, and he refused to be paid for the work, so the band compensated him with beer. Why the heck not, right? So, uh, but yeah, a, an excellent uh, capper to my backtracks for this year. Uh, a New Year's resolution of mine is to have more double albums uh, for backtracks in the coming year, so uh, assuming budget permits, uh, that will happen, I hope. So, but yeah, um, any favorite uh, December anniversary albums for you, uh, let me know in the comments. And uh, thank you for subscribing if you have subscribed. And if you haven't subscribed yet, come on, turn that red button white. Do it. I'd love to have you as a, as a subscriber. 
So yeah, thank you so much for watching. Um, I hope you enjoyed Backtracks. So anything you would like to see for Backtracks in the coming year, let me know. Um, and any other suggestions for this channel. But yeah, year-end lists are coming up very, very soon. And uh, yeah, again, thank you so, so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed it. Uh, see you very soon again. And remember, life's too short to be a music snob.